Just wanted to give a big thank you to everyone listening to this podcast episode. Our sponsor for this episode is Anchor. Anchor is the all-in-one place to record your podcast. And don't worry, it's completely free. It allows you to record straight from your phone or computer. You can also distribute your podcast through Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and so many more. So download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm. Working on set, you're all one. It's kind of like an un, unwritten language that you just you can communicate with very little, which is uh, always a better way to go. Way to go. go. This is the Action Filmmaking Decoded Podcast. A podcast dedicated to raw action analysis. Ooh, my gosh. For fans of action cinema out there, how badass would that be? Each week, we bring you a new action filmmaker to break down your favorite scenes. 360 off person, round kick the guy from a 360 spin. Now, introducing your hosts, Darren Tun and Mike Messina. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Action Filmmaking Podcast, a podcast dedicated to breaking down action films of all types. My name is Darren Tun. And with me is my amazing co-host, Mike Messina. Today we have a very special guest, Kier Beck. He has an extensive filmography, including award-winning stunt coordination for Mad Max Fury Road, Hacksaw Ridge, and his other works include Casino Royale, The Matrix series, and now Fast 9, Spiderhead, and The Matrix 4. Um, Kier, how have you been holding up with everything that's been going on? But you know what? It's, it's a, been a strange time to, uh, to be working around the world with the COVID pandemic, yeah. but I've, I've got to say amongst all the craziness, I've had a, a really productive and busy year. So I'm very grateful for that. Well, that's uh, awesome. I know that, yeah, I know a lot of people out there aren't having such a good year, but you know, I'm, I'm grateful that uh, there's still work out there for us, which is good. Mm-hmm. Mostly done virtually, but yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's definitely a new virtual world with the way we communicate. I know it's like 8.30 there, 8.30 a.m., yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's morning. Yeah, yeah. Early morning. Are you normally a morning person? <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I usually am, Darren, but since I've been in this quarantine thing, my time clock is just really, really strange. And I, and I think also the first week I was in here, I exercised myself to death and I'm so sore that I think that's messed me up a little bit as well. I can hardly walk. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. You have a little bit of a home gym over there? I do, man. I'm set up. I'm set up good. Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I think that's most of us right now with quarantine going on. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Got to be resourceful. Yeah. And you also mentioned that you were working on uh, Spiderhead. So how's that going? I mean, I know you can't re- probably reveal too much, but just like how's the production going in general? Yeah, great. They, they've they started their pre-production. So basically, I you know, I've, I've been running my, my pre-production from the hotel room. So, you know, that just usually involves phone calls and meetings and, uh, right. you know, gathering information about how we're going to tackle the sequences that we've got. That's awesome. Yeah. So we just want to jump into probably just like some general questions before we dive into like movie breakdowns. Uh, Mike, I know. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've been dying to know a little bit about uh, your past as a tree surgeon. It was super interesting to me. And I feel like, you know, someone you said in previous interviews that you had the dream of going into film and stunts since you were younger before you went to school for uh, horticulture in the States. So I'm wondering how formed was that dream of yours to go into film when you were younger? And at what point did you make the decision to really actually seriously go for stunts and the film world? Great question. You know, I I knew when I was at school growing up that I wanted to be in the film industry. I was always attracted to stunt work and I, you know, I used to watch all those Dukes of Hazards and all those shows on TV as a kid and just be fascinated with right. car crashes and, and the way they did action in films. I mean, I had no idea how they did it back then and 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 at the time I had no idea, but I was just always fascinated with the that, that, you know, it just looked like a really cool lifestyle to be involved with. So I, I left school and then, you know, my dad was like, oh, you should get a qualification and do something with your life. So I'm like, okay. So I, I studied horticulture, which then led on to 
becoming an arborist over in, actually I studied in just out of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania for uh, back in 1990, funnily enough, uh, at Longwood Gardens, which was a fantastic experience. So I learned to become an arborist there. Then all through the 90s, basically, I was just hooked on climbing trees and climbing rocks and mountains. So I, I kind of didn't get sidetracked, but I went on a journey of kind of just you know, climbing things and, and being physical and working with trees. And and then uh, that led on to, well, what happened was I, I bumped into an old school friend and she had just finished working on the Matrix film, the first one. And uh, she's like, oh, didn't you want to do stunts when you were at school? I'm like, yeah, I did. I did. And then from that evening, I was like, that's right. I, I should go off and do that. So I just, basically, I was living in Western Australia. I packed up my bags with my wife and then we moved over to Queensland and a month later I was working on the film Pitch Black with Vin Diesel. Oh yeah. Mm. Yeah. So uh, it, it just happened really quickly. Yeah. That's interesting. I knew that, I know that you've worked on um, the Matrix, Matrix sequels. I didn't know that your friend came off of the Matrix when you were sort of talking about whether or not you'd go into stunts. Did you run into that friend at any other point in further Matrix productions or anything like that? Um, not after, not after we'd, we'd bumped into each other. That was kind of like a, a one-off encounter where it was just a, you know, an impassing afternoon. And yeah, it was just a, a kind of very coincidental, but it was like a, she was sent as the messenger. <laughs> go and go and do stunts uh, before you get too old and crusty. Serendipity. <laughs> yeah, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, is that what she said? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's very, very cool. Yeah. And speaking of friends, actually, mm -hmm. Speaking of friends, I know that you have sort of a, a team of people that you've been working with for a while where you'll go into different stunts and, and productions and sets to work together. Can you talk a little bit about your team and what makes you all work together so well? You know, I, I, I've, I've always loved being a, a part of a team. And, I, and, I, and these days, you know, I more, I more manage the teams. But I've always, uh, you know, I've learned from experience that, you know, I've gone away in the past on films where I've been a solo player, as I call it, you know, it's sort of, they call you up and they say, hey, come and, come and, you know, like Casino Royale was a good example. I, I went over to do the opening, rig the opening sequence of that film and it, I went by myself and I, you walk into a team of, of really cool guys, but at the time they're all strangers, you don't know them. So, and that's always a little bit tricky when you're the when you're this sort of the odd one out. So, you know, over the years I've really just developed a, a you know a taste for going. Well, if I go somewhere, I'd really love to have the guys that I work with. Yeah, and you know then that the workflow is going to be a lot easier. You know that the language you're all speaking is familiar, so that when you're when you are working on set, it's you're all one. You're not sort of having to relearn a language mm. of how another team works or how people communicate with with each other. And in in the film industry, so it's less like back and forth. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the working on set in a in a high stress situation, the less communication that you have to have, the better, because you just want to be getting work done, and mm -hmm. you don't want to be debating or explaining or rehashing or saying something again it's it's kind of like an un, unwritten language that you just you can communicate with very little which is uh, always a better way to go mm. so it sounds like it might be an added layer of challenge if you need to coordinate with a local stunt crew or something like that uh, it, that you know what that when you are working on overseas productions and i've just come back from working on uncharted in berlin and and as as soon as you mm. take a, a shore to a, a film to another shore you're going to deal with obviously different teams, different ways of doing things, different ways of communication and different languages. So you have to become very savvy with that sort of stuff. And, and what makes it easier is to be surrounded by people that you're familiar with. Otherwise, you will be spending a lot of time working out what they're, what they're just saying in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. It must be, uh, like you're saying, difficult to have to rehash just, just the communication aspect of it. And let me say, very excited about what Uncharted is going to be like on the big screen. Definitely a big fan of the game. I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, it's going to be pretty epic. Gonna be pretty epic. <laughs> Good. I like that word. I like that word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really cool. And I think we're going to kick it over to Darren too. I think he's curious about your process a little bit. Yeah, oh, cool. yeah, okay. definitely. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm kind of wondering how stunts, I guess, like evolve from just being in your head to then going on and like performing it for real. Like, how does it go from that, just that idea to actually coming to fruition into real life? Yeah, it, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, the way my process has always been, I, I'm a super visual person. So, so for me, if I'm reading a script or, or looking at a storyboard or watching a previs, I've always been lucky where I can, I can sort of picture something in my mind, how I can see it would happen. Um, if it's mm. a, a rigging evolution, particularly, or a piece of action that involves rigging, I've always had this ability to sort of be able to look up at the sky in a sense and go, well, okay, the guy starts here and he ends here. So therefore the, the tool or the, the rigging structure that we would need in place to, would be, would kind of look like this. So I, I, you know, I picture cranes in my mind. I can picture where lines run. And so, so from mm. that, I, I usually do really bad drawings that, take more interpretation <laughs> <laughs> with other people to work them out. But, uh, you know, I always, I've always, i always been a believer that I, you capture your ideas before they escape because if you don't, mm. they're gone. So, you know, In any I, way you can, yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I've ripped pages out of phone books and scribbled on them in the past <laughs> to, uh, wow. to capture ideas, yeah. Uh, and I've just learned that, that, you know, these things are fleeting and uh, – and the more that you know, I used to stress about where ideas would come from and how we would achieve certain bits of action, whether it was a fight or a car chase or a, a rigging stunt. But then, uh, you know, after many years of doing it uh, now, I just kind of let it go. And I know that the ideas will come. And, and as soon as they come, you write them down. Even if they're not relevant, they could be relevant for something else or inspire right. you to think of, you know, what you're, what you're trying to achieve. Right, right. You need a way to like quickly capture those ideas, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if you could uh, see my hotel room at the moment. Oh my goodness. I, I'm a great believer in the sticky pad. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> ideas, sticky pads, sticky pads everywhere with all sorts of shit written on them. But it's, you know, for me, that's that's one of my, my go-to ways of capturing something. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and get up and jot ideas down and, and, yeah. uh, and go, you know, go back to bed knowing that I, I caught the thing. Yeah, I know somewhere you mentioned that you also use like Shot Pro um, and I guess like your iOS device to just plan things out in that way too. Yeah, definitely. When you're going to niche down onto, like if you've thought of a piece of choreography, particularly for car chases or car sequences, there's, you can you can kind of right. think of the choreography. Then um, usually what we do is we'll get the little matchbox cars out and we'll set them out on a table and then, oh yeah, yeah. I know Tom Struthers was saying something mm -hmm. about that too. Yeah, yeah. So we, you know, we take pictures of them. So we'll move the cars around and go. Well, this is, you know, this would be a profile. This would be this way. This would be a tracking shot. And then we would kind of map it out uh, and and photo photograph each little sequence like shot, like a um, storyboard. And then we would put that into Shot Pro and then Shot Pro the sequence. So then, you know, you can niche in on okay, how would we cover this piece of action? You know, are we left to right? Are we right, right to left? Are we down the line? Are we? How do we cover this? So, so Shot Pro is a is a great tool to to put your sequence together and and see if you've got your coverage. You know, before you go off and shoot something, and and you know, then you get to the edit and you go, oh, we should have got this and we should have got that. <laughs> I, I'm assuming it's also a great tool to like communicate to like the director that you're working with too. Absolutely, yeah. Because a lot of the time, those sort of sequences are very hard to to explain visually. Because mm -hmm. you know you can't stand there going, ah, then the car's sideways, and then this guy comes along here, and then he comes through an intersection. The director will be like, oh, stop! <laughs> <laughs> I work in I work in shot in in you know with this setup, this setup, this setup. So if you can show them shot pro, then you don't need to speak, and they can they can see it for themselves, and they can like it or not, or or go, okay, I love that, but let's change this and do that. And then that way, then the creative flow can start happening. Definitely. Because I think it's kind of difficult. I mean, still, when you're writing it down on paper, um, I think that's kind of how uh, I believe. I remember George Miller was saying that you just, everything was just pictures, um, kind of like an animatic format. Yeah, on, on Fury Road, the whole, it was thousands of them, thousands of, of storyboards. And uh, yeah. 
and and that was our that was our you know the visual representation of the whole film was was in storyboard form and it was you know that was genius because you could you could virtually watch the movie by turning the page and understand the vision kind of like a comic book yeah yeah oh it's brilliant yeah it really is brilliant way of doing it yeah that's awesome i, I kind of wanted to also transition uh into talking about writing and directing, because I know you also mm. uh, are into writing and directing, uh, similar to when we also interviewed like Sam Hargrave and his direction, uh, his transition into like directing with Extraction. Um, and yeah. I know you have a short film, uh, Driven. I'm kind of wondering what it was like transitioning from like stunt coordination to like the directing and writing side, and like what did you learn from like the stunt world that kind of carried over to like that project? You know, it, it's that's a great question. I, for me, the transition's been, you know, the filmmaking side of it is is uh, very familiar. So to be able to step from coordinating where you're, where you are in a sense, directing a sequence for the director, uh, as in terms of like orchestrating a stunt. So so the directing side of it, you know, I feel is quite it's a natural transition especially for a stunt coordinator who's who's always at the pointy end of the film set with the actors and the action right so you know you get to understand all of the departments and how they work you know what the do's dop is doing what the gaffer is doing what the grips are doing so technically you're always on point with the film crew so so technically speaking you know coordinator or stunt coordinators can transition quite easily into direction, um, you know, which has been great for me because, I, you know, I've, I've been on the pointy end of the stick for so many years. So you do get to see how directors work, how they interact with the actors. Yeah. You get to, you know, and, you, and you get to work with a, with a plethora of different directors. So you see, you know, how they do business, which is a, a you know, it's like a oh, yeah. paid education, really. Right, and, right. Yeah. Yeah. Being on set know, is like the best form of education. Oh, it's brilliant. It's it's really in this in the film industry to learn it. It's kind of really the best way to go. If I mean, if you get a formal education in film, then the next step would be right. Get on a film set because it's complete chaos. Mm. Oh yeah, and it's just it's <laughs> chaos and madness, and and it's hectic and confusing as shit. And then and that and that's where you uh, where you you know you kick up a gear and go, okay, this is rapid accelerated learning here by crikey, uh, <laughs> and. And um and then the writing side of it, I've I um you know, I, I just I woke up a few years ago and I thought, right, uh, the best way for me to really understand film and story and structure and plot and character and uh and you know, uh story arcs and you know, the hero's journey, et cetera, was to was to start writing. So okay. that's what I've done and I and I, I've I've really fallen into a niche of uh becoming addicted to writing and um that that to me now is the direction that I you know I've settled on because I just think being able to sit down and and write a screenplay and create characters and a story is is such a powerful tool not only to create the document which is the is the screenplay but also to really truly understand story and filmmaking because you you sit there and you write and you go well does this scene make sense is it am i writing something that's moving the story forwards or am i just writing something because i think it's a cool idea and you know think oh the audience is going to love this but really does it make any sense of the story does it does it do something to the characters is it interesting you know so so writing for me now is 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 a huge part of the process for for you know my journey as a filmmaker because i think that's the the starting point for the understanding of how it all works. Yeah, it makes you think very big picture, I feel like. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm also also someone who's addicted to writing a little bit and the the understanding of story that that gives you. I actually saw on Instagram um some sort of screenplay that said Sam Riley written by Kier Beck. Do you have any updates on what that is or where that's going? Yes, that's um that's a, a script that I've been doing for a couple of years now. I was sort of refining mm. and rewriting. And um, funnily enough, I, sh- I got a phone call with a producer after this call about Sam Riley. So it's a kind of a, a highly fueled action film uh, about a couple of brothers that 
one of the brothers dies in a, in a, a diamond heist. So, um, yeah, so it's a, you know, extraction plus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God bless like that. We'll be extraction. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. It was such a. It was great. I. I, I think it was just a breath of fresh air watching such a, uh, a different action movie for a change. No, no superheroes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and good luck in your meeting coming up. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. It's. Uh, it's good. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. And I know I heard one time some story about you having to really fight for a certain Mad Max stunt where you had a war boy jumping onto a car with with two sticks, two thunder sticks. Oh, uh, yes. I'm wondering how often do things get sort of contentious like that, where you have to fight someone to get something done or maybe pull back on something? Uh, you know, that, that particular stunt, the, the battle was with the, the, the engineer, the, the film set engineer who was sort of like the, the guy who walked around rating and, and certifying the way certain things were done, whether it was on a vehicle or a stunt like that, that one we were particularly trying to do. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I always, I run on intuition and I take my brain with me to defend my ideas. So that was a particularly, you know, that, that gag for me was, was I knew in my stomach that we could do it practically. So we could, we could rig it and take the vehicle out onto the road and, and do the stunt practically. Um, and that was just an intuitive idea and I could see the rig in my mind and, and, uh, we set it up, but I had, you know, just, you know, people doubting, you know, that the size of the structure was huge on the truck and it was very, it looked intimidating. And so, you know, when, when people get fearful or a bit nervous, they'll get defensive and, uh, you know, and, and not, not necessarily back you because they don't, they're unsure of the outcome themselves. So, you know, in that, in that, in that case, I won, <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is, I was never going to give up anyway. So wouldn't have mattered. Came out well, <laughs> came out well. Amazing stunt. <laughs> yeah. 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 Would you say that intuition you were talking about is something you naturally have, or is it something you had to develop over time? I, you know, that people have asked me that before. I think, my intuition, I mean, I guess things are always there and they just, you either grow them or you don't. But I, I think being an arborist for so many years taught me to to run on a gut feeling on how something would go. Because in the tree world, you only get one chance at, t- you know, taking the head out of a tree or dropping yeah. a tree or cutting a branch off. You You don't get to reset it if it goes wrong and, you know, kills someone's mailbox or, you know, rips a line of guttering off or hits a power line or there's, there's so many things that can go wrong in a, in a tree situation working with chainsaws and ropes and wind and weather and unpredictable trees that you have to have some sort of, some form of, uh, you know, the, the intuition gut feeling to make sure you're going to get it right. Because like I say, you can't, you can't put it back and have another go. Mm. And were there any particularly difficult rigs or stunts that you've ever had to sort of utilize that intuition for? Oh yeah, lots, lots and lots. <laughs> <laughs> a Casino Royale was one, was one of those because that was a, you know, that was a, a, a fairly intensive sequence to be able to, you know, do the, you know, do the characters jumping from crane to crane um, on the day. And the, the thing that made that tricky was that stunt was, was done on a call, so a, a five, four, three, two, one countdown. And on the day, the wash of the helicopters, which the helicopter which we had to shoot it, we didn't account for the fact that the down the down wash would affect the cranes. So the cranes were moving, and we couldn't tether the cranes off because of the uh, they have a windbreak on them. So we couldn't hold the cranes in position. So the cranes oh, were wow. moving back like slightly in and out so for the performers to jump they had to they had to um compensate for the movement to get the stunt right so i I just remember on the day just just going you know we had to be so on our game because then again that's a one take evolution even though we did it a couple of times if something goes wrong it goes Mm -hmm. wrong really badly (laughs) so you know so that was one of those occasions and another one for me probably one of the biggest ones was Mad Max sliding a guy on a motorbike uh, through the moving wheels of a semi-trailer mm. truck. And, uh, you know, that, that stunt 
had to be had to be absolutely 100% perfect with no with no out there was no out you know we couldn't abort mission or stop halfway through once the stunt started it had to it had to go through to fruition to finish uh and 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 perfectly because otherwise you know we're dealing with a semi trailer with really big tires on them and lots of them so you know that that to me was one of those days where I felt almost a little bit ill I was really happy when it was done mm. yeah 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 I'm sure it's it's definitely a lot of pressure having to have all those people's safety in your hands and trying to please everyone as well from the directors and the actors and of course the stunt people yeah oh yeah you you get it from all angles when you're dealing with that that sort of the pointy end of the stick when you're doing stunts like that, that you, yeah. you are, re, you are responsible for, for somebody else's life, you know, and you've got to, you've got to remember that first and foremost that, you know, it's not, a, it's not a game when you're doing things like that. You you want the outcome to be fantastic for the director, obviously, but more mm-hmm. so you, you want the outcome that the, uh, everyone's safe at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think that kind of moves on to my next question when, uh, I guess when building a rig, uh, where do you start? Like, what are the basics that you always kind of come back to? I guess, I guess my, you know, I have a, a sort of a formula of, you know, I always, I, I look at the, I, I start from the end, you know, where's like, if it's a, a guy moving from A to B or flying from A to B, I'll always go, okay, well, if I know where A is, um, but where's B? And then I can go, okay, if, to get somebody to this point here, I, you know, I, I kind of deconstruct and work backwards. So, you know, that, that's, right, right. you know, sort of a, a process that I have as, as far as going, okay, we need to move someone from here to there. How would it look? Is it a crane? Is it a truss grid? Is it something that moves above them? So there's, there's so many variables. So, you know, I kind of look at all of them at the same time and then eliminate. And, uh, and y- y- you always know that there's, 50 ways of doing the same thing. So you just kind of niche down to something that you're familiar with and you know that's going to be reliable as it can as it can work repeatedly the same way every time, which is one of the most important things. Yeah, so it's kind of like reverse engineering a little bit. Absolutely, the, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep, and then, uh, you know, and I, I always... You know, and I walk around for the, you know, once the rig is set up, it becomes a tool and then you use the tool to get the outcome. And, but at the same time, I'm always, you know, I have a, a little saying to myself, which is where's the Viper? What can I, you know, what, what's in there that I can, you know, that I haven't seen and what can I do better? Um, so that, that's kind of like a, for me, that's my, my way of in continuous improvement to look at my work. And even though it's, even if it's working, I'll look at it with a critical eye to just go, well, what have I missed and how can I do this better? And mm-hmm. uh, that, that sort of then translates to the next time you do something, you'll, you'll, you won't miss anything and you will do it better. Yeah. And I'm also wondering, so we were looking around online a little bit and we found some terms rigging for picture, combined rigging, and rigging for illusion. Can you enlighten us a little bit on what the differences between those are? Okay. Okay, sure, sure. Well, uh, I'll start with rigging with the, for illusion. So, illusion is is um, giving the sense that it's it's actually uh, Superman flying mm-hmm. without the assistance of wires. So, so rigging for illusion is is you know using using small small tech lines um, and uh, harnesses that are hidden underneath wardrobes. So, so then when uh, VFX take over. They paint out the wires and they they skim the wardrobe to get rid of the bulkiness of the harness. And and then that way the you know it looks like Superman's actually leaping up into space and flying around by himself. So that that's the illusion of of that side of rigging. And rigging for picture is um, best example is you know a Pirates of the Caribbean where you know someone's swinging on a on a rope through a through a sailing boat. So you're you're rigging is on picture, so it might be a, uh, a you know a prop mm-hmm. rope that you've in or you know you've, you've incorporated a, a safety line inside a prop hemp rope to attach to the actor so they can do a rope swing. So um, so the rigging is is seen on camera. And uh, and what was the combined, other one? Combined sort of combined rigging. <laughs> oh, combined. Yeah. Okay. So combined rigging is uh, often when you will combine. Um, a, a system which has rigging to the performer 
uh, and which will be, you know, which VFX will, will paint out and then um, you'll combine it with a set rigging as well. The same same sort of example, like it might be a, uh, a rope swing or a guy, someone climbing up a rope or, you know, in that sense where you're seeing, where you're seeing the picture rigging and you're not seeing the rigging that they're attached to. So th th those examples, um, technically what they're for is to establish early days who's responsible for what, mm -hmm. you know, as, as far as, you know, who rigs the prop rope, who rigs the, mm -hmm. the stunt rigging stuff. So, it's, um, so there's different teams for each. Yeah, like, that, like usually what would happen if there was a, um, a you know, a, you know, say, if, you know, Charlie opens the door and sees a rope and grabs it and starts climbing, you know, that could be the scene description. You go, well, okay, well, Charlie opens the door and sees a rope. Who put the rope there? Is that the, the art department or props? Mm. Or did, did okay. the stunt department put it there? Who, who's responsible for that rope and what is it? So that's just a, a production breakdown way of establishing responsibility, I guess, who, who's got ownership of something. Mm, interesting. And I, I was wondering also, too, because I saw um, in Mad Max, of course, you have the insane, I think he's called the Doof Warrior, the dude with the double electric flamethrowing guitar on the, the big speaker oh, yeah. car. <laughs> he's yeah. the one character yeah. who's actually strapped into the vehicle as part of the world. Yes. So I'm also wondering, like, was there any thought or any work on your part in terms of how those, you know, ropes and pulleys would look on picture, things like that. Uh, yeah. So, so that that that's a great one to bring up actually, because I because the art department originally, uh, well, of course they that you know that's the, their ownership is to create the that that whole vehicle and the um, the look of it and the, you know the guitar and the way um, the character was attached. Mm -hmm. And then what I where I came into play was that the bungees that were, he was on. So I I actually made the bungee, and then I I had laced um, a tech line through that bungee system so that uh, it acted as a as a redundancy in case something did break. But it also still gave him the ability to bounce around. So and and you know we supplied the pulleys in the art department, dressed them up to look like part of the vehicle. So. You know, that's a combination of us providing life support rigging that we knew was structural and uh, and integrous to be able to um, withstand the guy bouncing around on it and durable enough to last as long as it did for the for the show. And then the art department took over and dabbled paint on it and, you know, made it look all gacky and old like the rest of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the, the funniest and coolest parts of it too is that his guitar is also roped in, but not attached to him. It's separately uh, bungeed onto the vehicle. So he goes one way. The <laughs> yeah, yeah, the other yeah. Way. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've actually still got that little bungee that was attached to that guitar. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> when you start your rock. Yeah, but that, yeah so that, that again was us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We were also, so again, you know, we've been looking online, looking at all your works and things like that. We, of course, found that you... Uh, teach some instructional courses, and I was wondering where the idea for that sort of came from. Uh, yeah, so I, I I do I have been teaching, um, and I never thought I would actually, to be honest with you. But I, I it got to the point where I I just was sitting down one day, and I was like, you know, I have I have so many ideas, and I I've been I've kept a record of pretty much every rig that I've designed since nineteen. 98 in notebooks that's there's thousands of strange drawings and scribbles and notes on on rigs and and descriptions of how i've done things and i, I just you know one day i was thinking oh, it's a it's kind of a pity to keep it locked up and and uh and not share it with people so you know i just thought it's a I, i've been so fortunate in my career to to be able to have done what i've done and to be creative and to travel and you know and, and I just think it's a really nice thing to uh, to share what you've learnt and and give a few tips if it helps someone out along the way to to make their career work for them as well. That's a good thing. And you know, so I, you know, I've got a website and and uh, and you know, I just travel around the world every now and again. When I get time, I'll go and run a, a rigging course, and it's it's really nice to uh, to be able to share. And the, and the, the wonderful thing is actually on Uncharted. I think 
at a rigging crew of 32 guys and I think 24 of them had done my course ah, somewhere wow. around the world at some stage. So that was the, the payoff for me was to be able to be in Germany and call a guy from Poland and, and Slovakia and, <laughs> wow. you know, it, well, I think we had 11 different, nine different countries in our rigging crew because they they're all guys that had, had a, you know, stood out on the rigging courses. I'm like, okay, oh, I'll made a call from Ireland and this guy from here and someone from Estonia and which is, which is fun at the end of the day to be able to bring these people all together. And, right. and, you know, obviously they, they all understand the language because they've done the course. I think there was definitely a need for it, uh, a demand for it at least. Yeah, I, I think so. I, and, and I mean, the, the big win for me is the fact that, uh, and I've just experienced so many different scenarios as far as um, outcomes and, uh, go and I just see that education and and safety go hand in hand and and so, and also longevity in the film industry and just you know if I can make a few little improvements to keep keep people safe and uh, and give you know they can walk away with with a little bit more knowledge on on particularly on the safety side of it then I think that's a that's a, a good thing to do for the industry definitely and I'm wondering kind of like after teaching all these classes and writing your book. Uh, what are like some common mistakes that you've seen like in beginner stunt riggers? Um, probably, probably getting out of their depth too easily because sometimes okay. it's easy to be pressured into doing things that you're not quite ready to take mm-hmm. on. So you know, administratively, someone who's got a you know a limited uh, experience, particularly in the rigging world. Can be asked to do something that they that they might not be comfortable to do, but they they'll say yes because they're afraid of the consequence of saying, "Hey, no, I'm not I'm not the guy for the job," or "Hey, that's that's mm. probably a bit too much," or "Let me let me you know do some research," or "Let me get someone who can help and contribute to get the outcome you're after." So those sort of things uh, can catch people out, and and little mistakes. You know, not setting end marks in rigs and just been, uh, you know, not having the the experience to be aware of something that could become a risk. Yeah, I think it's like you said, taking on stunts that are, I guess, bigger than you. Um, I believe you mentioned before. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and it's always, I mean, when you have the experience, yeah. it's fine to take on challenges that, you know, are possibly out of your depth. But the, if you can... If you can manage the risk, if you can manage, the, you know, the, the hazardous sides of it and rig your way around those things, you can do anything. But it's just being, it's putting that as a priority, which is the most important thing. How do I manage the risk of this evolution to get a safe outcome? And then it doesn't matter if you are jumping, a, you know, someone off a huge skyscraper or whatever. If you can manage the risk, then you'll be able to do it. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, um, I guess people should do it right now but um what are i guess some of some simple rig systems that someone can practice with and i guess build at home like if they're like an intro i don't know if they're like new to rigging i guess uh, probably the easiest thing i mean other than the normal the standard skill to being able to tie knots and and mm. create pulley systems and all of that stuff and 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 splicing too which is a you know a huge part of the bizo i would start with you know, it's easy to, you know, providing the tree is structural enough to, to chuck a sling and a pulley and a single rope in a tree and, and uh, you know, do a penji, you know, pendulum rigs, which are, you know, if you watch any old Hong Kong martial arts film, you, you'll see people flying, you know, flying around and jumping and leaping. And that's all done on a, you know, it's a sort of the one pulley, one rope theory that you just attach someone and it could be even in a rock climbing. Wire through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just bounce around on the on something very simple. Then you can you know you can upgrade to a slack line rig, which is, a, you know, a super effective and easy way to to move people around in a, in a bigger space. And it, oh, uh, yeah. you know, it's only slack lines, one rope, one pulley, and a pull line, and someone on the end of it. Wow! <laughs> That's how I started <laughs> my, my trees at home with the trees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Darren <laughs> and I'll definitely. It's uh... good to know. 
Yeah. We'll jump out. Yeah. We'll start messing with some trees. There you go. There you go. Oh. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Don't rig off dead branches. That's all I've got to say. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be great. So I'd love to transition here and talk about some of your uh, specific works. One that I'd love to talk about is Danger Close. It's this Australian Vietnam War film that you were part of, and you were actually action director for it. So could you tell me a little bit about what yep. that role entails and how it was different from other roles you've had in the past? So I guess what that was, was um, to be an action director. So it's it's working directly beside the director, Creve, who uh, who did a fantastic job on Danger Close. So so an action director, director is someone that will not only uh, as a stunt coordinator, I'd choreograph the action, but then as the, as a director, you're having a, an involvement with how to cover the sequence. So we would shoot blocks of of action as a previs, and then you take the previs, and obviously the director signs off on it. Then on the day, you'll be involved with going right. Well, the best place to cover this little sequence or piece of action is to put a camera here, here, and here, and um, and then. So you're you're in, you're just a, one more step involved in in the sort of as a stunt coordinator you would you would facilitate and bring the action to set and then the director and the DOP would then determine how to cover the sequence. But as a as an action director, you're bringing the sequence to set and then orchestrating how the sequence gets filmed as well. Okay. And so did you ever feel an urge to sort of jump into the more nitty gritty of the creative process for the roles that maybe you used to have? Or were you very comfortable letting some other people take the reins there? I mean, it, it it's kind of a progressive thing. Like sometimes you do let, you know, you present action on set and you, you, you hand it over to, uh, you know, the adults, so to speak, as far as the, how the director or the DOP want to cover the, cover the sequence. But um, you know, and I've and that's a that's an important sort of part of the evolution of of moving on as well. I think if you you know you get in there and you see how directors and DOPs cover sequences and you learn, okay, well that that camera angle works, that camera angle doesn't work, and then as you progress, you can be, you know, you can present your action and say, well, to get the most effective cover, you'd cover it from here and here and here, and and then that way it. it then you start to progress into into being able to you know direct the action or to become a second unit director or you know eventually direct stuff like Sam has mm. and Chad Stilowski. And so, especially as action director specifically, did you feel any added responsibility or even challenge since this was portraying a historic battle to portray things with historical accuracy? I mean, yes, yes, and uh, it's kind of a good question. Yes. You want it to be, uh, I guess, the film itself and the story uh, has to be historically correct. Uh, but the action is always, you know, the, we, we tried to make all of the deaths in the film um, really, you know, super realistic as, you know, as a body that doesn't get shot and blasted back like in, you know, you know a Sylvester Stallone mm -hmm. movie. But, you know, you want it to be, you want yeah. that side of it to be realistic and a little bit shocking, you know, because it's so it's so unflattering to just be shot and fall down dead. So we, you know, in that terms, we respect, we kept that realistic. And obviously there's some non-realism, you know, we had a few guys getting blown up and blasted through the air with explosions, which, you know, just complements the action and, and, and it makes it more exciting for the audience to watch. Yeah. And I think talking about uh, historical war films too, uh, I want to kind of touch on Hacksaw Ridge as well. Um, because I know in Hacksaw Ridge, there's this famous scene where Desmond Doss actually builds a rope system to send the soldiers down. Uh, I'm kind of wondering, were you heavily involved in the process of like designing that rope system? And uh, if so, what was it like for you? Yeah, I yeah I I, I built the rope system for that. Oh, wow. Sequence. Yeah. yeah so, so that was, and that's a great example of rigging for picture. So we had uh, we had a a line, a tech line that we we had dressed by the art department so they they uh they sort of degraded the line to make it look like a, a an old cable or rope and um you know we rigged it up and we had tripods and concrete blocks and you know uh, wherever there was a hemp line we had tech line running through it so basically we we did we built that whole system for from scratch you know we did the same with the 
um, the, the little trolley that was on there for the uh, soldiers to get lowered on. We built that as well and we had tech lines running through that. So yeah, we dressed down the pulleys that were rated and so that was a, a whole process that we we undertook to achieve that. Yeah. And I, I kind of like it because I know earlier in the film, there was like this ongoing joke that Desmond kind of ties the knot wrong, kind of like a bra, but it kind of mm. like ends up working out well for him. Yeah. 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 I, I showed him how to tie the bow line. The funny thing was on the day I had to tie it around him, but when you tie something backwards, when you tie something facing away from you, I, I almost didn't get it right. To tell you the truth, I stood there a little bit of a panic moment going, Oh, I don't actually think I've tied a bowline this this way for a long time, but I still managed to do it, which was lucky. Saved a bit of embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I knew you, there was some probably inspiration from you in that in that scene. Mm. Yeah, it's got, it is fun to be able to, you know, watch the movie and and see. Oh, I go, oh, I tied that knot, and oh, I instigated that the way that got done. So that's always, a, you know, that's the that's the bone, that's the payoff, I guess of being able to watch something that you worked on that turned out really, really well. Oh, yeah. And uh, I know we're kind of running a little bit short on time. I don't know how much time you have exactly. Uh, I just want to... Uh, I'm in I'm in quarantine, bro. I've got all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, but I, I wanted to move on to Mad Max, actually. Because um, I want... Uh, well, I wanted to know, what was your relationship like with uh, George Miller and the team at Mad Max? Oh, that, fantastic! I mean, that, it's that when you work on a on a film, especially an Australian production like that, it's just a great big family. Like uh, George Miller is, you know, he's just the most wonderful person you could ever meet, and you 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 know you you're inspired to do a really good job because he's just such an incredible person to be around as a person and as a director and as someone that cares for his film crew. So, you know, when you're, when you're surrounded by people like that, you're, you're inspired to always be doing better and well and, and making sure the project has a, has a great outcome. Yeah. And I know you mentioned also that uh, George kind of put very little restrictions on what you could do. Um, do you think you could talk about how much, I guess, creative freedom you had with uh, the creative process for like designing these stunts? Sure. Well, I guess, I mean, once you, you're you always going to stick to a, a particular glide path on the from the storyboards uh, as far as, you know, what, what the images they are wanting to capture. But as far as creatively coming up with the way to achieve that and to, you know, to exacerbate and make it a little bit more, a little bit bigger and a little bit more sort of, you know, hectic or grand, there was... You know, I never, I don't, I don't think I got told once on the whole show to pull back or stop hiring cranes or stop buying miles and miles of rope. So for me, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a, a private free for all creatively because I could just go for it. And yeah. you know, I don't think, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever work on a show that like that again with that, that sort of ability to, to have a, you know, a huge crack at it. So George was just kind of like, just keep going. <laughs> Don't stop. Yeah. Yeah. He was just like, this is, yeah. He was just like, whatever you turn up with, we'll shoot. So I'm like, Roger that. I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Damn. So like any idea kind of just got in, got into the film somehow. Yeah. I mean, everything we, all of the stunts that we rigged, I don't think, I don't think any of them didn't make it into the film, which is, which is amazing. You know, usually you, you rig stuff and you do things and certain things don't make it that, you know, we, everything that we did was in there, which was fantastic. Yeah. It all looks great. This is actually, this is the single movie that I had to sneak into to see, cause I, I saw the trailer for it, all the stunts, all the action and me and my friend just, you know, we, we had to see it in the theater on the big screen and it was, it was worth seeing it. Too. Oh yeah. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Mate. Oh, I believe. Yeah. 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 You were telling me that you were uh, you were under age at the time. I yeah, think. yeah, still in that's high school. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, well done. Thank well you, done. thank you. It was worth it. It was worth it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I I still look at it now and just wonder how the hell we did it. <laughs> I really do. Yeah, and I know actually, um, during shooting, the lead actors were talking a little bit about how they weren't sure if it was going to come together. Like they couldn't see it in their heads, what George Miller was envisioning. Did you personally 
were you able to sort of see it coming together or did you have any doubts about how you guys were capturing it on film? Uh, you know, no, I, I, I didn't have any doubts at all or any, any sort of like you would watch playback and see rushes from the dailies and, uh, and, and just witnessing, you know, being on set, watching them, you know, photograph the sequences. So for me, I, I kind of always just, and, and understanding the other Mad Max films, it, you know, I, I could see, you know, I didn't know exactly what the story, you know, how it was going to cut together in completion, obviously, but I could mm. see the story coming together mm. and I, I could understand the journey of Mad Max and Furiosa and, and what was going on. So, you know, I never, I never doubted that this is, you know, when you're working on something that epic and that intense, you just know, you just know that it's, it's going to be good. Yeah, definitely. And it definitely was good. Um, and then I have to go back to that flamethrowing uh, guitar player again one more time. So I'm wondering, I know it was a, a popular Australian musician, Iota, who was up in the rig over there with the guitar. Was he actually playing? Yep. And did you have to overcome any challenges to rig him so that he would be able to actually play up there? Yeah, well, he, he, he had a, a couple of doubles that would, uh, and funnily, both of them could play the guitar, so not as well as he could, obviously. But but Iota did do uh, a fair amount of work up on the Doof vehicle with the guitar playing. So you know, periodically he would be up there for you know hours doing you know take after take or shot after shot. And uh, yeah, the, the the whole thing worked as a real as a real musical kit. Um, obviously, on the you know in the in the edits they they you know went over the music again, but on the day he could play the guitar and it was, wow. it was pretty epic. In real time. Yeah. 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 Right. It was very cool. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of these stunts are like on top of like moving vehicles. And I saw some behind the scenes where you guys just shot uh, without moving the vehicles and just shot from the ground up. Uh, I'm kind of wondering what the difference is between rigging on a moving vehicle versus just the flat ground. Like, yeah, sure, sure. Well, sometimes so so if we if we're doing a a static shot, uh, but trying to create the illusion of it moving, we're doing a sim trav shot. So the the vehicle might be uh, on a on a sim trav base, which gives the you know the articulation of a moving vehicle, mm. uh, and then it's basically wind and wind and dust, and uh, and and sometimes we would shoot that way because. It might have been something very specific to capture, like a close up or or a certain piece of action that required the that, that that's you're better off shooting it statically to save time and to be right. more efficient rather than taking something out on the road and and trying to do something that you know if you just put wind mm -hmm. and dust in the background it would work right. just as just as the audience well. can't tell the difference if it's just the sky you know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, financially, and uh, and you know, and just in terms of actual filmmaking, it's better sometimes to be able to just sim trav something and get and get an insert or get an acting beat. Uh, yeah, that that's often the best way to go. Unless you know you, you you're shooting plate shots and you can, you know, or you go out on the road and do it for real, or you shoot plate shots and do it as a sim trav element. And when you were yeah yeah. When you were going, in, oh sorry. sorry. <laughs> when you were going in to grab those shots, is there a sense of, uh, like, were you relieved? Like, oh, thank God, we can sort of slow down the pace and we don't have to be gunning it down the desert in a car to get these shots. Or were uh, you disappointed a little bit? Uh, uh, no, sometimes you. I mean, no, it, that's a good question because sometimes it, there's so much going on. Like, you might be doing a sim trav shot. Uh, of uh, you know picking up a, a, a small element from a sequence you've done the day before or leading up to something else, but on on when you're in that environment, you're going okay. I've got to do this. I'm going to do this sim trav thing, and then I've got to whiz over to the other location, check out the lads who are rigging this, and then I've got to think about what's going on tomorrow, and then uh, shit, I've got to build the trust grid for that thing next week. So that mm -hmm. your brain is just constantly going okay. I've got to make sure I've got three guys here and two guys here. I need three operators on that rig. Okay, shit, let's get this done. And so that you kind of, your brain is working at a million mile an hour. And if you're doing, you know, if you are doing a sim trap thing, the, the best thing is that you can go and grab a cup of tea and a muffin and, uh, and 
you know, you don't have to be on the road in the dust and out there in the heat and bumping around on the road trying to do something. So it does give you some reprieve to to take a moment, but at the same time, you're you're still you're still planning. You're still there's other rigs, other right. evolutions, prep happening. So it's a it's just part of your day. It just turns into you know that part of your day. Yeah, and I think. When we're talking about the vehicles moving, how fast were those vehicles actually going? Uh, and uh, you do like that illusion of a uh, high speed, I guess, on camera. Yeah. So, so sometimes, I mean, the vehicles didn't particularly go hugely fast, mm-hmm. and they didn't really need to. I mean, that 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 again comes down to to filmmaking and how you you know you know frame rates and how you how you shoot sequences and stuff. So. So not necessarily anywhere between, you know, maybe up to 60 kilometres an hour at times, which which in terms of film is, is you know, when you're looking at through a little square box, it looks quite quick. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, so, so it doesn't need to be huge. I mean, films like Fast and Furious, which I did last year, I mean, they are, they are going quick. You know, they're doing... Oh, they they're going hundred. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like the like the title, you know, they they, they don't muck around. <laughs> Surprisingly, actually, because I hadn't done a fast film until last year, so you know, when you're mm. actually involved with it, you go, wow, that actually they, you know, they do drive fast. Mm. <laughs> Whereas Mad wow. Max didn't have to be, you know, it didn't have yeah. to be. There's so yeah. much going on in sequences that you you there's you a lot going on on the top of the cars. Cars. Absolutely everywhere. Yeah, and I think that was kind of where the attention was was focused. But I'm kind of wondering, yeah. like, was it the same patch of land that you guys were going like back and forth on, or were you guys just going? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, yes. There was a, oh, there was one location called Blanky Flats, which is a part of the Namib Desert, and uh, oh. it's literally I haven't been to the I haven't been to the moon, but I imagine it's pretty bloody close <laughs> to what it would be like on the surface. There's just nothing there, hey. So we would Miles. we would go. Yeah, we would go back and forth and back and forth on on that same patch of ground. But there was there was multiple multiple locations in Namibia that we shot at, you know, mm-hmm. sort of stretching, you know, be a couple of hundred kilometers apart between locations sometimes. Yeah, because I know you also had that like night scene as well. It was just a completely different landscape. Yeah, that place was so brutal. It was <laughs> it was just. Everyone hated that. It was so oh. cold. It's right on the ocean, so it would just oh, get okay. this brutal, bitter, cold wind whipping off the ocean at night. There's oh, just man. no no place you can hide from it. <laughs> well, it was kind of like a little bit different, like texture, the ground too, and everything. Yeah, it was. It was in a uh, a very salty area of of coastal mm-hmm. plain, and uh, they had this. Uh, like a bacteria in the ground that made the ground sort of pinkish color, like a pinkish color. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'd actually love to keep talking about sand for a second. Um, so I know there's a whole lot of physics calculations that go into your stunts, and I know sand can really change the mm-hmm. the friction and the profile of a surface. So is that a factor when you were planning out, especially the cars for the stunts? Yeah, the, the soil is always a, a, a big consideration for how vehicles are going to behave mm-hmm. i mean it mm-hmm. could be as just as much as the damn things will get bogged or they'll um you know they don't steer as well they you know you'll bog into the sand and you'll 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 plane or drift in the direction that you don't particularly want to go in because of the soil density so uh you know always you know that's you can always see the drivers of the vehicles kicking the ground and and having a good look at the surface capability mm. to be able to gauge what their vehicles are going to be able to do in it. So it's, a, yeah, it's a huge consideration, big, big difference to working on solid surfaces or bitumen. Mm. I'm kind of wondering how much do physics and calculations come into play when planning out these stunts? Yeah, it's a, it's a fair bit as far, I mean, with, with the vehicles, it's more about precision and timing and, and the speed of entry and the speed of exit or the speed of hitting something. So so sort of the physics side of that is is more or less how well a vehicle responds, what's it, what is it capable of doing. Whereas uh, with other physical stunts that involve rigging, yes, physics, there's, there's a lot of physics involved, and especially when you add, you combine movement of people on a moving vehicle, uh, then 
then physics changes its world completely because then you're dealing with anomalies of, you know, inertia created by the vehicle, inertia created by the performer combined with the inertia of a vehicle. So there's, you know, physics, uh, not that I'm, I did any sort of physics at school, but you kind of get a pretty quick uh, education on how it all works when you're, when you're combining those elements together, that's for sure. Gotcha. It's a useful skill, I guess, for stunt coordinators in general. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm actually a physics major right now. I want to go into film, so that's the perfect answer. For when people ask me, oh, what are you going to do with your degree? I thought I'd have to say, like, nothing with a physics degree. Ah, there you go. Well, you know how to, you know what, what inertia means and movement and uh, acceleration and deceleration. They're, they're the sort of things that you have to uh, equate for when you're, when you're dealing with people and rigging and machines, winches and ratchets and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, were there any small victories, I guess, uh, or stunts that might have been overlooked by the audience, but I guess the crew found satisfying? In, in, in Fury Road, I guess. Yeah, yeah in uh, Fury Road. Uh, I, I don't know, actually. I think, I think looking back at it, I, I get lots of, lots of comments about the, you know, the sliding the guy under the truck, the jump off the back of the, uh, the war rig, and uh, some of the motorbike jumps and the guys getting pulled off the bikes in the air. So there's, yeah, I guess it's kind of like a, a bit of a combo pack, really. You know, people love certain things and more than others, I guess. So it's, you know, it's well-rounded, I suppose, the answer. Definitely. Uh, Mike, I know you have a couple other ones that you want I to I do, remember. yeah. I think this might be one of our last Bad Max questions, but uh, couldn't help but notice that there's a scene where the war rig is winched up to a tree to get itself moving again. So did you happen to have anything to do with that particular stunt with the tree? <laughs> I was there the night they did the uh, the winching out with the dead uh -huh. tree. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, a bit, little bit unrealistic, I guess, that the dead tree would pull a big vehicle like that out of a bog. But yeah, it was, it was there. It was a special effects gag, more or less. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, okay. We're thinking that it kind of related yeah. to your tree experience a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did check the tree out. <laughs> it's just, well, it was well dead. <laughs> dead, yeah, okay. It really brought the career full circle, I think. Uh-huh, yeah, absolutely. I'd actually also love to ask you a little bit about the Uncharted film that you mentioned already, because, again, I'm a big fan of that franchise. One of my favorite game studios of all time is responsible for that game. Did you happen to have any relationship with the franchise before joining onto the film? No, I didn't. Uh, to be to be honest with you, I didn't even know Uncharted was a game <laughs> until someone until someone told me. So I'm sorry, but uh, yes, no, I didn't. I didn't. That'll be epic mm -hmm. again. Great work. We've made great it work. epic. Epic for sure. And. Oh, thanks, buddy. You know, I, I know a lot of video game adaptations, especially for films, get a bad rap. Do you think, is this the one to really change that trend? I hope so. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be good to have worked on the one that worked. I got high hopes for it, high hopes. Looks like a good team. Yeah, yeah, De yep, definitely. I think Tom All Holland right. and Mark Wahlberg make it. Wait, what, Mark Wahlberg? <laughs> yeah, Tom Holland and Mark Wahlberg are in it. Interesting. I knew one, I didn't know the other. Yeah. Mm, mm. Yeah, they did a great job. Well, I think this is going to be our last question. But before that, uh, I just want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Uh, it's been great having you and just loved hearing what you had to say about Mad Max. Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's great to, uh, great to chat. Definitely. Our final question is kind of going to be like a fun one. But if you could build your own mm -hmm. Mad Max rig, uh, what would be, the, I guess, the Kierbeck Mad Max car? What would that look like? Ooh. Ooh, that's a good question. It'd have to be the uh, Mad Max. It'd have to be the, the the last of the great V8s, as he says. <laughs> I'd, I'd I'd go with the Charger. Ah, the Charger, Defi definitely. Yeah, yeah. Charger with a big old donk sticking out the front and the uh, and no no bonnet. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you so much, Kier, for coming on the podcast. Cheers, guys. Yes, thanks, Darren. Thanks, Mike. Yep, thank you.